Father, we give you thanks today for an opportunity to hear your word, opportunity for your word to become alive in our heart and life. Father, I pray that you would take the words of my mouth today and customize it to the life of those that are listening. Father, I thank you that the word of God has the highest authority. and We look to it for the final say. We give you thanks today in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Imagine with me for a moment that you are going on a trip. And it's a trip that you must take. There's no getting out of going on this journey, going on this adventure. But before you get all excited about this trip, I want to tell you something. That this trip that you're going to be going on, it's very, very dangerous. In fact, there are some landmines that have been hidden in the direction and in the path that you must take. N not only are there landmines that you're going to have to navigate, but there are some pitfalls, and, and those pitfalls are covered so you will not see them. And when you go through the landmines and the pitfalls, you're going to come up against quicksand that you did not see, and you did not recognize, and you do not know that is there. And, and you're going to be going on this journey, and all of these things that are set up to take you out that have been arranged strategically to keep you from finishing your journey, I, I want to just let you know that all of these things will be hidden. You will not anticipate them, and what looks like something and a safe is not going to be safe at all. Now, but let me say this. You're going on this journey that has these pitfalls, these landmines, but there's one who has written a map, a very detailed map of where every landmine is, where every pitfall is, and where all the quicksand is, and where all the, the, the things that are trying to take you out, they have it designed and mapped out, and every plan that the enemy has to destroy you is laid out on this map. So my question to you, you're going on this journey, there's no way out, it is extremely dangerous, but someone has provided a very high detailed map for you to navigate that journey. My question to you is this, how are you going to treat that map? Are you just going to look at it, ball it up, put it in your pocket? Are you going to look at it one time and say, I think I got it. Throw it away, discard it. Will you ignore it? Will you just read it once a week? You'll read it on day one of your journey, but then you'll take the next six days to kind of map it out yourself. Probably not because your life is dependent upon the instructions that are on the map. In fact, that map is probably going to become the most precious thing in your entire possession. Because without that map protecting you, providing, navigating you through the, 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 the challenges, then you're, nothing that you have in life will matter because your life will be over. We are all on this journey called life. 
And it all started when you were born and it's a journey that you must take. And in this journey, as many of us already have known, there are minefields, there are pitfalls, there are landmines, all designed to keep you from completing your journey. But God has provided a map, a very detailed map that if you will look to the map, if you will study the map, it's called the Word of God, He will give you the insight. He'll give you the, 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 the revelation that is needed so that you can complete the journey. Here's what I know. What you think about the map will affect how well you do on your journey. How you think about the map that God has provided, the word of God will determine. Will you ignore it? Will you just look at it but not really pay any attention to what it says? Will you just look at it on Sunday but then live the rest of the week and ignore the map the rest of the week and just kind of on Sunday? Is, would that be how you're going to treat the map? Because you know what? The Word of God is the only thing essential because I want us to complete the journey that God's called each and every one of us to. And God's called every one of you on a specific journey. God's specifically given us a time, a start date, a finish date for us to complete the journey that God has called us to. The enemy has a strategy. And that strategy is to keep you from completing the journey that God has called you on. He has a strategy, and I'm going to show you in the Word of God today. In fact, today, we're going to title today, Exposing Satan's Strategy. And we're just going to expose a little bit through the Word of God of how the enemy operates, how the enemy thinks, and, and all of these things. And we are now, if you haven't found out, ladies, we are in football season. Okay? We waited almost six months, eight months for football season, and it's back. Come on. And, um, and, and, and so we're in football season, and of course, I, my favorite team of all teams is your Lafayette Christian Academy Knights, all right? It's just, it's just one of my favorites. I was speaking to the coaches this week. Several of them serve in our TFC kids. And, and I went in there last Sunday and I said, hey, we got Jesuit this Friday night, which was three nights ago. I said, what do they look like on film? Because a, a football coach... And, and, and football coaches, they get the film of the team that they're going to play the following week or this coming weekend. I don't know if you know that, but they exchange film. It's been going on for years. In fact, when we receive film from an opposing team or a team that we're going to play, the statistics are already broken down. It tells this coach, this team passes 70% of the time, they run 30% of the time. On first and 10 from the 30-yard line, 70% of the time, this is the play they run. I don't know if y'all knew that. Y'all thought it was just a game. We we're out there just to have fun. No, we're serious about it. <laughs> and depending on the opponent, that coach and that coaching staff will spend hours upon hours studying the tendencies, the percentages, the skill set, the, the natural inclination of the athletes that will be on the field. You'll hear a basketball coach say, defend him on the left because he always goes right. 
How does he know he always goes right? He don't know him. He's watched film. And the, the, the football coaches, they, they, they understand, they get fully acquainted with the group that they want to destroy. Right? Can I just help you? Satan has game film on you. Did you know that? He knows your moves. In fact, there's been a demonic angel called a demon that just follows you a lot of times and watches you, knows your tendencies, knows what grabs your attention, knows which ways you walk, knows your strengths, knows your weaknesses. The, the enemy has done a whole lot of strategic planning on your life to keep you from reaching your destiny. They, they know your weak spots. They, 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 know your, your, they, they know your tendencies. They, they, they know where you spend your time. They know what grabs your attention. Your focus, 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 and then one thought and your whole mind races in another direction. The enemy knows that way too much. And, and he tailor makes a strategy to bring destruction into your life. That's what he does, right? And, and, and to bring negative consequences into your life. How many has ever made a decision and you've had to suffer the consequences from that decision? Raise both hands, some of y'all. We've all been there. We all made a decision and then when we think back and we look back on the pain that it's caused, on the money that it's caused, on the, on the heartburn that it's caused. We look back and say, man, that was such a bad decision. And that's what the enemy does. So I, I want to spend just a few more moments today and we won't be able to. I want to give you six strategies that the enemy uses in our life every day. We get it right out of the book of, of Genesis in Genesis chapter number three. And we're going to look at how the enemy strategizes and how he uses his plan to keep us from doing what God's called us to do. And uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to flip the table and we're going to do a little strategy on the enemy. We're going to watch a little game film of the enemy and we're going to expose him today. Come on, how many want to expose the enemy today? Get ready. Go quick. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent was crafty. That word crafty there means sneaky. It means slippery. It means, it means clever. It's, it's very sneaky and clever and strategic in its moves. So when the enemy wants to make a move into your life, he knows what he needs to become. He needs to become slippery and sneaky and very clever. And we find him in the garden and he says to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Do you find it strange that an animal is talking to a human? You ever know, you ever, you ever kind of grasp that? And not only is the snake talking, the snake is walking. So you got a walking, talking snake talking to a woman in the middle of the day, and it's normal. You say, well, how do you know the snake was walking? Because the Bible says after this, there's going to be a curse and you're going to be cursed to your belly the rest of your day. Evidently, he was walking before the curse, right? And, um, and so he's walking. And he says, did God really say? I, I want you to catch this. The, the first conversation that the enemy has, the first Recorded conversation between the enemy and the human 
God's creation is a conversation about God. But notice how he left out one word. He left out the word Lord. Because whenever God gave them, he says, me, the Lord God, commands this from you, Adam and Eve. But then the serpent goes and he says, did God really say? He left out the word Lord. You see, the word God deals with God's power. It's the word Elohim. It's God's power. The word Lord deals with a relationship that you and I can have with the Lord God Almighty. It's a personal relationship. You see, the serpent wanted to bring up religion, but he didn't want to bring up relationship, so he left the word Lord out. Can I, can I just help you? You know what? Can I just help you? The devil really could care less if you go to church on Sunday. He could care less. He doesn't care. He doesn't care that you spend an hour and 20, 30 minutes on Sunday worshiping God and, 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 and coming to church or, or being religious in your, in your demeanor and in your uh, vocabulary. He could care less. But, but what he cares about is that you don't ever have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's concerned about. When all of a sudden you begin to talk to him in the morning and you talk to him in the evening and before you make a decision, you go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need direction. Lord, I need you to speak to me. All of a sudden now, when you start acting like you have a relationship with him, he gets real nervous. But as long as you're just going to church, as long as you're just reciting the prayer, as long as you're praying over the food, it don't scare him one bit. And so when Satan, uh, watch this. Who created the animals in the garden? Not a trick question, follow me. <laughs> Who created the animals in the garden? When God created in the garden, at the end of the creation, he looked at the animals and he said, this is good. Who created the snakes? Everything God created was so the Satan, the, 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 the snake talking to Eve was, oh, I lost some of y'all, y'all. Y'all hearing stuff you ain't never heard before. Just follow me now. Everything God created was, God created the animals, right? God created the snakes, right? Everything God created was, and everything God created, he gave an instruction to Adam and Eve. And he says, everything that I've created is to be under your dominion, is to be under your leadership, is to be under your authority. So in the garden, Satan, when he wants to derail Adam and Eve, he takes on the form of something good, but sneaky and clever. And, 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 and so hear me, here's, here's strategy number one. So this is what the enemy does. He always uses something that looks good. Are you hearing me? If you're looking for horns in a red jumpsuit with a pitchfork, you're never going to find it. You know where you're going to find it? He's going to use something that is good to create something that is bad so that you can have consequences for pursuing it. That's what he always does. Have you ever been to a magic show? Maybe you've seen these little clips on YouTube or Facebook, these illusionists, they're amazing. I've actually watched YouTube videos and I'll slow it down. And I, little bit by little bit, and I still don't get it. They're amazing at their craft. And what you find is they get your attention here. And while you're looking there, they lying down here. They doing something down here. It's called sleight of hand. They, they get you to look here. And when you look there, then he's actually doing something down here. And what this is, is it's a distraction Hey, and the enemy 
does that with our life. Hey, let me show you something good. This is going to be really good. This is really what you need. This is going to change your life. This, this is going to be amazing right here. And while you're looking at that going, ooh, ah, wow, wow, he's doing something over here that's actually going to be a detriment and actually going to cost you a whole lot of time, energy, money, and pain. But we're caught up here. Look, the enemy uses something that's good to bring pain and consequences into your life. It's amazing. The world is so good at it. You've probably gotten this letter that I've gotten before. You open up the letter, congratulations. You did it. You're now platinum at American Express. And because of your platinumness, we have increased your credit $7,000. You did it. You the man. You got it going on. You're now platinum. And we get that letter and man, I don't know, but it feels good to be platinum. Right? I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm platinum with Delta Airlines. And if you've ever been to the airline, they'll call the first class passengers and all the diamond and platinum members come on listen when I when there's a hundred people out there 300 people waiting to get and they call it I, I'll come on somebody how y'all are how y'all doing I'm getting on first now we all get there at the same time but there's just something about being platinum come on and and, and listen to this, watch this and the delta gets you every year Every year that I continue my platinum status, they give me a new bag tag. Now I got four. I got stuff. I got platinum on my screwdriver in my, in my, in my tool shed. We platinum, y'all. And we platinum. And we in, because of my credit score, they've increased my credit. Oh, we know what's happening. Because like me, like you, we've paid off those platinumish stuff. Minimum payment month after month, decade after decade. Paid the price of you smelling all platinum. Start, start smelling yourself and it gets you in a lot of trouble, right? That's what the enemy does. The enemy says to you, Brad, congratulations. You did it, son. You're platinum. And with that status, I'm going to give you this. And it's got all the frills and it's got all the benefits. And boy, it looks good. And boy, it's promising. Boy, it's enticing but you're going to pay it back. Because if you use it, you're going to pay it back every day and I'm going to charge you interest and I'm going to compound that interest and you're never going to get out of the trap because it looked good, but it wasn't good. It was actually evil. Satan will always tempt you with something good. Come on, somebody. That's strategy number one. Here's a second strategy found in the same verse. Watch this. He wants you to think that God's holding out on you. It's how the enemy gets to destroy your life. He wants you to believe that God is keeping you from the fun. He's holding out. He ain't telling you everything. He don't want you to experience everything. He don't want you to have fun like everybody else. So the enemy, that's his strategy. We're doing game film on the devil. He wants you to think that God's holding you out. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. He came to her. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree 
in the garden. Notices, he never references all of the other trees that she could eat from. He never talks about all the freedom she has. He talks about the one. Go to verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. We'll talk about that again in just a moment. But he wants you to think that God's holding out on you. He doesn't want you to see all the freedom that you do have. He wants to paint God in such a way and to convince you that God does not want you to have a good time and a good life. And watch what he does. He takes God's command. God commanded Adam and Eve, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was a command. Watch what the enemy does. The enemy reduces God's command into a question. Watch what he says. Verse, go, go to verse 1 again. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? He took God's command and turns it into a question. Listen, when you reduce God's command into a question, it lessens the impact. Why? Well, it's just a question. Micah, I'm just asking a question. Don't get all upset, Micah. Don't get all bent out of shape. I was just asking a simple question. And, and, and when you turn God's command into a question, it lessens the impact. You feel better about it. But let me just help you. Watch this. You ought to write this down. God's no's are so we can enjoy his yeses. I don't even know if that's the right punctuation. I don't care. God's no's are so we can enjoy his yeses. See, what the enemy did was show her all that she can't have, all that she can't become, all that she can't touch, all that she can't eat. And he never says, but you know what? There's 50 million other things that you can enjoy all you want all day long. He just focuses on the one thing you can't. Right? And, and he tries to convince us that God's holding out. I told you, oh yeah, God has all this. But God's, he's really holding out on you. Have you ever seen a kid at Christmas get a bunch of gifts, but the one thing that he really wanted he didn't get? And he's so upset about the one thing that he didn't get, he can't even enjoy the other gifts that he did get. Some of y'all, it's how you do God. I'll move on. You better play something, Merlon. You better play. That little spirit, boy, we need it. We need it back. Who that something? Play something. So the first strategy is what? He always tempts you with something good. And he just he's slippery and sneaky. The second thing is he tries to make you think that God's holding out on you. Here's a third strategy, and that is this. He wants you to believe that God's word cannot be trusted. You cannot trust God's word. Here's what he says. Genesis 2, Genesis 3, 2 and 3. We may eat from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. and You must not touch it, touch it or you will die. Next verse. You will certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Oh, excuse me. I was like, what happened to my verse here? You will not certainly die in other words you can't trust God's word you can't trust the word of God the 
the Word of God was written 2,000 years ago. 4,000 years if you include the Old Testament. We live in a new world now. We got all this technology and we got all this science and we can put people on the moon and this is so outdated. You can't, woman, you can't trust God. What does what is, what is God know? This is not going to hurt you. This, this is not going to hurt you. You can, you can engage with this. This is not going to hurt you. It, you you're not going to go into debt. It's just, it's just one little, it's just one little drug one time. You're never going to have a, an addiction that's going to cost you everything that you have, including your wife and your children and your kids and your job and your future. And I'll take everything from you. He doesn't show you all that. He shows you a good time. It's not going to cost you. No one will know. It's, it's really no big deal. It's not going to make you emotionally inst- unstable. Come on, you can taste of this fruit. Your wife will never know. You can, you can, you can be a part of this. It's really not going to take much from you. It's really not going to be that bad. You can have of the fruit. You won't get a disease. It's the strategy of the enemy. Can't trust God's word. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 3, that that God is true and everyone that contradicts his truth is a liar. The Bible says this in in John chapter 8 verse 44, that the enemy, that Satan is the father of lies. He just, so to be a father, you got to have children. How many know any children of lies? They lie all the time. You can tell how a politician, when a politician lies. You know how you can tell? His lips are moving. There you go. Play something on that keyboard. The enemy, all he wants to do He wants to hurt you. His job is to keep you from finishing and getting to the finish line. And he's going to do everything in his sneaky, slithery, clever way to get you to fall. Get you to quit. Get you to give up. Lose hope. And never have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. That's his ultimate goal. Is to hurt you. One of the things I almost cannot watch makes me turn my head is when you see videos of people innocently hurting uh, 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 Someone hurting an innocent person. I I, I saw a video of this Asian woman going to her apartment with a bag of groceries and going to cook food for her children. And she's mugged on the staircase getting to, and you can see in the video, she's racing to her door. She unlocks it. And as she's closing it, the muggers open the door and slam her to the ground and beat her. You can't hardly watch it the kid that gets bullied at school because he looks a certain way or talks a certain way or or has a an athleticism a certain level that they can't understand or looks a different color and they get beat up by bullies just because of how they were created and made by God. It breaks your heart or to see someone uh, older someone intentionally hurt a child do you know that's, that's what the enemy wants to do? He wants to hurt us, inflict pain, show us something good so that our marriage erodes. 
It's just pornography. It's in the secrecy of your own bedroom. No one is going to know. It doesn't directly affect your wife at all. It really has no consequences at all. It's just pleasure. It won't erode your marriage, I promise. It won't make you look at your wife any different than what you're looking at. He's clever. He's good. And he wants to bring harm. I'll close with this theological story. A banker was hunting one morning in his duck blind. Small flock of ducks fly over, pulls the gun, shoots. Bird falls out of the air. Bam. Right onto the farmer's property next door to where he was hunting. He goes to retrieve the duck that's dead in the farmer's yard. The farmer comes out of the barn. As he's trying to retrieve the duck, the farmer stops and says, Excuse me, sir, that's my duck. And the, the banker said, No, sir, that, that, that's, I shot that duck. It just fell there, but that's my duck. He said, No, this is my property. That's my fence. Therefore, that is my duck. No, but sir, I was just hunting in that blind. I know where you were, and I know where you shot, but this duck is on my property. This is my duck. The banker said, I got, let's just, set, I got, let's just settle it this way. How about this? The banker, kind of young and strong and a little muscle mass to him. The farmer just looked a little bit older, not as strong. He said, how about this? How about you punch me in the face as hard as you can. And then I'm going to punch you in the face as hard as I can. And whoever screams the loudest loses the duck. He said, okay. Man, the banker thought, I'm about to knock this old man out and take my duck. The banker looks at the old farmer and says, you go first. The farmer reared back and hit him right in the jaw. The banker just kind of and stood back up and then with a smile on his face said it's my turn he goes no that's all right you can have the duck <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with my message but man I just love that joke the enemy is out to steal your ducks <laughs> and cause as much pain as he can in the process. We are going to expose the enemy. The enemy is nothing more. The Bible says that he is a fake. He is a, he is a, what's the word? He's, he's a fake. He's a, uh, I wrote it down. Let me see if I can find it real quick. He's, He's a counterfeit. That's the word I'm looking for. He's a counterfeit. The enemy has counterfeit doctrine, counterfeit teachers, counterfeit spirits, counterfeit miracles, all in order to do one thing, to trick us, to show us one thing, and then do another. But we're going to expose the enemy's game plan and strategy over my life. So let's, what do we do? Put the strategies back up here. Let's, let's reverse the strategy. Let's put the, he always makes something that looks good. Every time you go, you say, God, is this, is sometimes I have to make a decision. It seems like a good decision. It seems like the best decision. But there are times you got to say, God, this is what it seems. This is what it feels. This is what I'm leading to. But God, Holy Spirit, I need you to guide me. Holy Spirit, I need you to guide me. He's not just God. He's the Lord God. He is a father. He is someone that I can refer to. He is someone that I can ask. He is someone that I can bring. And so, so we reverse that strategy by saying, even though it looks good, whoa, that new car that looks good is this God's plan for my life 
Is this really God's plan for my life? I know it looks good and I know it feels good. And boy, I'd look good in it. Boy, I tell you that. But is this really God's plan for my life? Second thing, he wants you to think that God's holding out on you. The Bible says no good thing will he withhold. No good thing will he withhold. God's not holding out on you. You say, I pray every day. God, I thank you that you are giving me everything that you have assigned to me. God, I thank you that everything, every package with my name on it from heaven is coming my way. God, I thank you that you bless my life. You bless me going. You bless me coming. You bless everywhere that my feet go. You're going to give me the victory. God, I look to you and I look to you alone. You are my source of strength. You are my source of joy. You are my income. You are my provider. You are everything that I need. And you are not holding back on me. You are giving me everything that you have promised me by your word. We reverse that strategy. Strategy number three was God's word cannot be trusted. God, I trust your word. I trust it so much. I'm going to read it every day. I trust it so much. I'm going to memorize a scripture every now and then, every day, every morning. I'm going to tr- I trust your word. Your Bible says that heaven and earth will one day pass away. But my word will never pass away. Come on, somebody. A great philosopher a great philosopher wrote because of all the degrees and all of the education that he had acquired and all of the all of the all of the certificates of training and all of the all of the the, the degrees that he got he he had taken all of that information and knowledge that he had learned and he came up with a strategy and he put on a, on a placard it said god is dead And he signed his name. 32 years after he penned that thing, he died. And then somebody wrote, I think his name was Nails. God is dead, Nails. Somebody put, Nails is dead, God. Come on, God has the final say. God always has the final say, amen. Father, we give you thanks today for your word. We give you thanks today for your promises. Father, we're going to reverse the enemy's strategy. Father, next week as we continue, we'll cover the other three strategies that the enemy uses on a daily basis to cause harm to our life. Father, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. I've taken a few extra minutes. That's because a fourth grader outside earlier said, Pastor Jay, go a little bit longer today. So for my heart, for the fourth graders, I went a few minutes extra so that he can slide one more time.